Thanks, Mark. Um, I could probably dispense with part of the bio, well, not the biohacking stuff, but the bio about me bio stuff because the have kindly done that for me, including the sorry tale of how I arrived here in terms of um, the other ethanol kind of substance that you can apparently get hold of at university. So, quick thing about me couple of years of stu uh, uh, drink studying and then some other stuff in between going back and doing some other stuff and doing um, biology, that thing sounded cool, let's do that for a while. Unfortunately was a little bit too good at it and stuck with it for too long and ended up doing a, some other, other letters and stuff and whatever in it. Whilst at the same time still being involved in the IT industry and uh, subsequently the computer security and network security and all that other stuff. So for the last, that's a long time, 10 years I've been an academic or epidemic. Uh, as a lecturer at uh, Edith Cowan Uni in Perth and for my sins I've also been put in charge of all the course admin stuff which is nowhere near stuff all the good stuff. Alright, enough blah, let's get into it. So what I'm going to do, and this is kind of difficult because I'm go, basically going to try and cram about 10 years worth of biology kind of stuff in 45 minutes. Let's give an overview of what kind of things you need to know, what's some of the background of what are these things you're playing with, what can they do, what can you do, what kind of things do you really not want to do, like wipe out the earth and that kind of thing. And then also some of the costs involved and the barriers to entry and all those kinds of things. So first off, it's going to go back to biology 101 for a bit. And let's go back and talk about a few things about DNA, how it works, RNAs and a whole bunch of other things, including evil, evil viruses. DNA evolution, the whole point of us kind of being here, having evolved from other stuff, mostly not chimp, well, apparently mostly chimp, but a little bit not chimp, is that we've got this stuff, DNA, and there's some evolutionary process through a process of selection. The stuff that's not so good gets wiped out, and the stuff that has an advantage or is advantageous to a particular environmental bad thing is what gets left behind. Really interesting read for those of you that haven't already is Richard Dawkins' Selfish Gene, uh, that talks about basically the whole lot of us being nothing more than useless pink buckets of water carrying around the DNA, because that's really the stuff that's important. That's kind of interesting, really. Mutations do occur constantly in your DNA. There's a whole bunch of mechanisms in there to stop it happening, but it does happen. Mostly, kind of tends to be fatal. Things kind of die when the genes go wrong. But it is kind of important to ensure that we survive. Macroevolution, microevolution. Um, there's a whole bunch of theories about macro. Macro is something we haven't actually observed. Microevolution we observe quite frequently. Uh, one of the common ones that gets used, thrown around, is moths on trees. Um, back in the industrial age, there were uh, species of moth in the UK, some of which were white, some of which were grey. They used to live on trees. The trees were kind of a white bark, and then all the soot and smoke of the atmosphere made the trees go kind of dark and grey and black. Strange enough, all the white moths that stood out, the tree got eaten. All the ones that were grey didn't get eaten, they survived, they lived. That's kind of microevolution in action with a kind of enforced speciation. We can do that as I'll get to, we can force that upon um, different species based on their reproductive rate and make them do things that we wanted to do, sometimes not so much. DNA is highly stable. It really doesn't want to be messed with. And there's some good reasons for that we'll go into. Um, mutations, you can, you can very easily make stuff. You can go out and buy some stuff from a chemist, but if you extract a certain compound from it, put it in the wrong part of you, you will have mutations and bad things occur to you. But I wouldn't really recommend that. Traits. A trait is an expression of a gene. And we'll get to what all that actually is and means shortly. So the evolution part is DNA itself is highly stable. And the process of turning a DNA gene sequence of letters into you is a very highly regulated process with an awful lot of steps involved and a lot of chemical pathways and a lot of enzymes and reactions and stuff. Kind of going to gloss over a lot of that and say that thing produces that thing and you get that thing. Um, so I apologise a little bit if there's perhaps for some of you some detail lacking. Um, feel free to come and beat me with something later and I'll happily tell you if I can. Deoxyribonucleic acid. I'm sure we've heard that. We all know the acronym. We've all done biology. DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. It's a nucleic acid. We call it a base pair. DNA, double helix ladder thing. Two bits of it joined together. Again, part of the process of it not fooing itself is that it has semi-conservative replication. When cells split and divide, one half of the DNA when it splits, one original always goes into a new cell. You don't have two new ones in that one, two old ones in that one. It splits, copies itself, old one that one, old one that one. So you've always got kind of a kind of redundancy built into the DNA. 
It's in every living, and some not, we'll get to that, organism, and it's all identical. It's exactly the same stuff. The DNA you extract from a goldfish, or a chimp, or a rabbit, or a plant, or a fungus, or a virus, or a bacterium, or anything else, it's all exactly the same stuff. It's these four nucleotide base pairs. That gives us another advantage that we'll look at later on. We won't get so much into the philosophical debate about where that all originated and how and all that kind of stuff. It was obviously aliens. <laughs> adenine, guanine, oh, and this, I've got proof. Adenine, guanine, cytosine, thiamine. A, G, C, T. Those are our yes, four, four base pairs that we care about. A only ever bonds to T. C only ever bonds to G. And there's a chemical reason with the things aligning the themselves as to why they do that. You end up with this really huge, and here's a picture, doesn't matter the details so much, apart from the fact there's a whole bunch of letters of A, C, and Gs, and Ts. If you sequence DNA, any DNA, that's what you'll end up with. There's a whole bunch of A, C, and Gs, and Ts in a particular order. That's all it is. It's just a code. Seriously, literally, it's just code. And the process that goes on our cells makes a copy of the code and then executes it, turns it into proteins, based on the order of the code in your DNA. That's it. Basically, that's what it does. We call this, however, the way that that's done is not individually, it's done in blocks of three. And if I bring that other picture back up, you'll see that all of these, apart from that first one for some unknown reason, are all in blocks of three. So we've kind of got a quadrant, quadrity, four thingamy of ACGT going on, and then we turn that actually into a trinary sequence. So the ACGT thing, the order of that determines the trinary sequence thing. Again, yeah, doesn't matter that much. The human genome, you guys, most of you, have 46 chromosomes, 23 the haploid number, which are in your gametes or sex cells. Three billion of those base pairs. So the AGCT things, you take all your chromosomes out, straighten them all out into a long line, which actually is quite kind of long, and read all along there, you'll just see three billion ACGTs born and be grown. Tees, you know. Only 1% of those actually code for proteins. And that is all that happens. DNA makes nothing. DNA codes for proteins. Your cells make proteins. That is all they do. That's it. They make proteins. The proteins assemble themselves in different stuff. Arms, legs, livers, eyeballs, hair, all that kind of thing. But ultimately, DNA codes for proteins. It also does some other stuff. So 1% turns into actual product. The other 25% we've got here controls genetic regulation and expression. It says, that gene there, we need some of that. Go and turn that on. That one over there, do that. So this is a command and control sequence that sits in your DNA as well. So it's not just a protein thing. The rest of it, mm -hmm. no one really knows. Um, you have these regions in a sequence here. That's a kind of a chromosome there, that diagram up in the corner. We have a promoter thing which says, hey, you should start doing something here. Start reading something. Then we have a thing here, hey, that's an enzyme. We should read this thing off, turn it into a protein which becomes an enzyme. Cool. Enzymes are good because they break stuff and breaking things is good. We also have little sequences called stop codons. When I read along this part and I read that part of the code, that there says I should stop doing something now, whatever it was that I was doing. So the bits that we actually turn into something are <coughs> conversely called the exons. The bits that do nothing are introns. There's a whole bunch of theory about the intron thing. It's kind of like the biology equivalent to the Big Bang Theory. It's kind of like, yeah, well, maybe it's that, maybe it's that. Mm -hmm. There's not enough evidence currently to determine why that is. Uh, more diagrams because it's less reading of slides. Left hand side here we have a basic structure of how DNA works. It's kind of seen the ladder there and you've got your ACGT bonding occurring in the middle and we have some indie things and uh, sugar phosphate backbone. That's all we really care about. There's a whole bunch of stuff we could go into about replication in terms of five prime, three prime ends. I don't need a reason one or the other. Because I can fragments. Blah, blah. Way too much depth and not relevant. You can do this yourself, and this stuff's becoming increasingly cheap. If you want to sequence your own genome, you can pay some people some money, or you can go and buy your own sequencer. Sequences read genomes. Um, that one there is one I saw on this labx.com site this morning. For a mere bargain, four or five thousand, four or five thousand dollars. Some a bit cheaper, some a lot more expensive, some a lot more expensive, like seven hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of expensive. Uh, another one I came across is Oxford Nanopore guys who are claiming to have a nanotech based kind of thingy which will be under a thousand bucks and you'll be able to sequence the entire human genome in a few hours, which is pretty cool. The initial human genome project took like uh, about a decade and hundreds of millions of dollars to sequence the full genome. 
Okay, so we have a big cell, and we have in the middle of the cell nucleus, or we do, bacteria don't. In the middle of that, we have all our DNA, which is a big, although it's a ladder, it spends the vast majority of its time curled up in a big crunchy ball. When we want it to do something, it uncurls, and we make a copy of it. We don't want to mess directly with the DNA, we don't want that going outside the nucleus. It's called a nucleotide nucleic acid for a reason, it likes being in the nucleus, it doesn't go out. So what we do with it is then the process of transcription and translation. Transcribe, make a copy of it. And we have a type of RNA, a ribonucleic acid, which is kind of like DNA, except it's got oxygen. And DNA will unwind at the desired point, this mRNA stuff comes along, let's get a picture, that makes it easier. Sort of. So on the left hand side here in the cell nucleus we have our DNA, it's unwound at a particular point, and we have this RNA which makes a copy. So it codes it with a complementary code. So where we have a CAG on the DNA, we'll have a GT G on the other side. Uh, except it's not T, we have no T's in RNA. So we have cytosine, guanine, adenine, and no thymine, we have uracil. Don't know why. Couldn't be bothered looking it up, too lazy. Translation, we take our transcribed RNA and then we actually turn that into our protein sequence. We have amino acids, which are tiny little blocks that we can use to make up a protein. So we assemble these amino acids, we get our code on, our triplet base pair, and we have a code. We have a decoder ring, spy decoder ring, just like that. And you can actually determine what it means. So if you've got your DNA sequence, which you can get, you can pay some people some money and they'll give you a DNA sequence. Get your secret spider decoder in and you can work out what proteins your genes are making. Cool. Do we care? Mm, not really because you can't mess with that. And most genetic expression is multigenic. Remember that? P's, big P's, little P's, that kind of stuff. Big T, little T, and you do that, you get blue eyes, all that kind of thing. So if you've got that gene there, you'll get blue eyes. Well, kind of not. Most genetic expression is as a result of that gene, that gene, that gene, producing those proteins, which when mixed together, man, you get that other thing over there. So although we kind of know we can read the human genome and say, well, if you've got that gene there, you're going to die. You there, that guy, you're going to die. <laughs> Shouldn't have left that sample on So, not quite straightforward. We know that we do a kind of a reverse engineering. We know if that person has that disease and we sequence their genome, well, everyone that's got that disease has got that gene there. So that's got to be involved somehow. And at the moment, that's kind of about where we are. And we know that we can kind of switch that gene off somehow we can maybe stop that disease from happening. That's pretty much kind of the state of play where we are now. You can't just simply rewrite your entire DNA because it doesn't like being rewritten and the exact copy of that is in every single cell of you and of any organism. So that's like a really difficult thing to do. Fun things to do with codons in DNA. Storage, it's just code. And it's got a whole lot of redundancy and a whole bunch of other things already built in there. Um, there's a guy at Harvard who was doing this. One gram of DNA will store 700 terabytes of data. And that's with redundancy and a whole bunch of other stuff. He's basically used a kind of IP um, where he's got headers and a whole bunch of other stuff in it to control data flow and all the rest of it. So think about it. How, how many hard drives are 700 terabytes of data? A lot. If I take a gram of DNA and oh, I lost my phone. stick it in a tube, stick it on a shelf somewhere, leave it there, come back in a thousand years, I'll still be able to read it. What's the chance of still being able to read 700 terabytes worth of mechanical spinny hard drives in a thousand years? Give it 10 years, we're probably going to have moved on to something else and no more starter interfaces and whatever else. But mm. uh, What else can you do? Visualise them. Get your own genomic code, grab DAVX or one of the other visualisation tools, throw it in there, spit it out, make some shiny graphs and go, look, there's my DNA as a box. Or whatever other thing you might want. All right. Let's, um, we're going to see if we can try and play some noise. Something else we can do. This is the sequence for a red blood cell where someone has taken the A, G, C's and T's and looked at some of the promoter regions and the start stop bits, used that to determine pitch and length, and basically turned the red blood cell into, I don't know, we go as far as we call it music. But it's certainly a sound of some sort. If you play the different sequences for different kind of stuff, not just red blood cells, you certainly do get obviously awesome B grade horror movie kind of music. <laughs> not so sure so much about that you actually want to be driving on the car and hey, this is good stuff. That's enough. <laughs> enough. Uh, that was kind of that goes back into 
guy doing this somewhere in Eastern Europe in the mid 90s and doesn't look like anyone's played with it since. So some of it's bored. Um, you probably don't want to use your own DNA as a crypto key because if you lose a hair, you're probably kind of stuffed. <laughs> the whole thing about the DNA being in every gene, that might come back to bite you. Um, pros and you, um, sorry, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Pros and use if you so wish. Prokaryotes, normally single celled, no nucleus, nor membrane bound organelles, cell suit. It's a kind of a casey thing with a whole bunch of stuff just kind of randomly floating around in there. And it's got a tail. They have tails, which is kind of cool. And the tails move around. And the bacteria swim. Um, either bacteria or these wacky things called archaea things. Um, the other important thing we want to know about this is that DNA is stored in a plasmid, so they have a big circle. We have lots of ladders, they have a circle. And the circle scrunches on itself and it hides in there until it needs to do something. Something we'll get to. Uh, as an excuse, I'm hoping, hoping people in the back rows can kind of read that. It's uh, XKCD on um, sort of about RK. They're also called extremophiles because um, they are found in some really wacky fire environments and they, some of them potentially possibly have um, arsenic based as opposed to oxygen and other stuff, which is kind of cool. You find them near the bottom of volcanoes and all sorts of kind of other places. They're kind of like sort of bacteria that live in weird wacky places. Um, so the XKC is kind of basically a bunch of sciencey nerdy types who decided that serving a theme based alcohol party based on what they're talking about, which is arsenic arcade, to guess might be a good idea. Apparently. Who would have known? Uh, eukaryotes, that's kind of us. Everything that isn't bacteria or archaea or evil, evil viruses are eukaryotes. They do have a cell nucleus and membrane bound organelles, most of which are stolen. Most of the stuff in there that does stuff in our cells has been stolen from other things at some point earlier on in our evolutionary pathway. Um, animal cells, plant cells, plant cells have a cell wall, animal cells don't. Not really that relevant. Let's give an idea of some kind of scale. So a red blood cell, which is not really a full cell, doesn't have the DNA nucleus thing going on. Um, cell, red blood cell, because red blood cells have to move in and out of our cells to transfer oxygen and that kind of important thing. So a red blood cell is much smaller. The diagram up here, you see in the top left, shows a bacteria relative to a red blood cell, which is like, again, way smaller than an actual regular cell. And the bottom corner there, there's some evil, evil alien viruses in the corner. We buy that again, go a bit further, zoom in on bacteria, you can see some of the viruses there. Um, smallpox on the top right, um, the lunar lambda kind of thing there, and some other much smaller polio and various other tobacco mosaic and other viruses. The that thing, that evil alien lander thing, that's real. They really look like that. They're freaky scary. Go around and Google on the webs some bacteria T4 phages. You'll see them. Electron microscope images. They look like that. And the thing in the middle, that actually they detach and jab it in there and do evil things, nasty, bad viruses. The rest of them you can sort of go, okay, little round things, I'm good with that. But that thing, no, it just freaks me out. <laughs> I don't like it. And they're really, 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 they're not, they're, they're undead, okay, let's be, let's, let's be honest about this, they are the undead, they are evidence of the undead, and also the stuff that they do is evidence that these aliens, I tell you. They're basically just an assembled cluster of proteins, that's how small they are, they're really, really small, they're actually not alive. They don't move by themselves, it's literally, where the name computer virus got its name from, is these things. It's literally just got some code in it, either RNA or DNA, that sits inside that shell. If you grab one of those things, snap it in half, rip its head off, stick it on another one, it'll regrow and just do its thing and spread that DNA instead. So you kind of can't even really kill them. <laughs> they require a carrier. They need to be moved by something. Um, by you coughing or sneezing or through blood or through some other media, um, liquid that they can move in. They don't move, they move through brownian motion or some other kind of mechanism that they get from one place to another. Just randomly. They're not, they don't target anything. In, well, they kind of do because they're evil. They do have targets, so the, the arrangement of the proteins on the outside of them determine what they bond to or not, or what they target or not, or what they break or not. Um, they enter other cells, use the machinery of that host to replicate. So they kind of randomly end up in something and go, hey, that looks like I want that protein can attach to that protein and boom, away we go. I'm going to spit my genetic DNA material into you, take over your DNA, RNA replication translation factory, use that to produce my own genetic stuff and then just destroy you and move on. Well, most bacteria. Called lysine. 
So bacteria, viruses that do that kind of stuff to bacteria we call bacteriophages. Um, they're not an evolutionary pathway. Nothing evolved from them. Nothing, they didn't really kind of seem to evolve from anything else. And what do they do? They just mess with your DNA. That is all they do. And they can do some funky stuff. So the transcription, translation, expression. Genetic expression pathway. DNA. DNA unwinds, you make a copy of it, which is RNA. You take that RNA and you read that off and you make it a bunch of proteins. All good. This stuff can go the other way. It has an enzyme called reverse transcriptase where it can take an RNA from anything and turn that back into DNA and stitch it back into your genes. Evil, bad, bad virus. So what, what purpose does this serve? I guess if we kind of look at this whole selfish gene thing, maybe they're just a basic form of the expression of the genes getting from one place to another in a really simple, easy manner. It's aliens. Definitely aliens. Right. Bacteria. Three ways that bacteria distribute their DNA. Um, firstly, when a mummy and daddy bacteria love each other very much and they meet up in the cell, they form, they actually form a thing called, it's called a pillus. And they form a tube between the two bacteria and they have a meaningful exchange of bodily fluids where they exchange their DNAs. And that's where they can exchange genetic information. Conjugation, strange enough, who would have thought. Transformation, they just grab random bits of RNA or DNA from their environment and they go, that looks cool, I'll stick that in my little circle plasma thing. Let's see what that does. They do that as well. Or you can make them do that. Uh, and the last one is the evil bacteriophage down here, transduction. Where this thing comes in here, lands on the edge here, rams into the bacteria, spits out its RNA, DNA, makes a copy of it, whatever, goes, hey, you've got that now, you've replicated my DNA for me, cool, thanks very much for that. And now I'm going to do something really nasty to you. So we've actually got um, some video footage of this occurring. We'll make sure we match that with VLC, because we doesn't get it sucks. Badly. <laughs> Alright. So what we have here... Finally, these kind of people have volunteered. Oh, well, yeah. awesome. So this is a virus carrier from description here. And on the plate it's got a virus. And the... Let's call this guy here John. And the guy down the left here... Is the bacteria. Played here by this point, unfortunately. What he's introducing in here too, see? The carrier is introducing the virus. Viruses don't move by themselves. So on this tray here is a virus. And the virus will be introduced to the bacteria. The bacteria tries to resist, but it cannot. DNA is now rep replicating from the virus inside the bacterial host. And the license process is done. Spreading the genetic material far away. Enough puny monsters. Plants are. It's going to some real stuff. Plants are very cool, and not just because I spent 10 years chopping little bastards up into little pieces and sticking them in little cells and jelly. They do some cool things. Not all cells in a tree may be genetically identical. So we had this rule about every cell in an organism, all the DNA is all exactly the same. Plants kind of break that sometimes. We don't know why. Another tree, sequence their DNA. That one's going to be different from that one. Strange. And they're kind of an organism within an organism. You can take some cells from the plant, do some nasty things to them, screen them, hey, how much will that one live if we give it really, really lots of salt to grow in that they don't like when we're growing? And some of them will live, some will die. Hey, we've got some evolutionary stuff. Let's grab those ones that lived and grow them back into trees. They don't exhibit that salt tolerance anymore. It just disappears. So there's some weird stuff going on where they'll do things at a cellular level. It doesn't translate to a whole plant level. Um, they exhibit total potency. Strange word. But you can take one cell from anywhere in the plant, one cell, and regrow an entire tree from it. That's genetically identical to that. We can't do that with humans because we're a bit too more kind of complex yet. So all cells in an organism contain exact copy of that DNA that allows us to do that. It's all about hormones and enzymes and all that kind of stuff. 
and the plants are pretty simple in this aspect and it's pretty easy to actually take them, give them cancer and then make them grow with whichever arms and legs we want on them. Plant hacking, why? A number of different reasons. Phytoremediation is a fairly common one. We may want to grow a plant that can suck all the evil things out of soil. Um, radioactivity, heavy metals, salts, all kinds of stuff. Plants will do this. We can make them do it, have them suck all the bad stuff out, take the plants away, you've got the bad stuff. It's kind of a cool hippie, I mean, kind of a cool reason for wanting to do that. You may want to mess with fruits or vegetables or something. You may want to make them grow bigger or smaller. Yes, yeah, bigger. Bigger bananas, yay. Shape, change colour, change flavour, all that kind of stuff. Um, back in the day, I wanted to do this one of the conferences I went to before I got booted out of the profession was insert sweet protein, take a gene that coded for a, a sweet protein, stick it in a Brussels sprout. I don't care, still no one's going to eat those things. Um, that's an example of genetic modification. We take one little bit of sequence and we stick it into a plant, as opposed to conventional plant breeding, which is screwing with the entire genome of a plant because that's somehow so much easier and safer than just putting one gene in. Uh, Sorry, I'm getting into a GMA debate there, don't want to go there. Three things you can do to hack plants. Um, you can induce polyploid. So we make their genetic material double within the cell. And they do live through that, and that gets us to do some cool things we'll see. Taller, better, faster, stronger plants, and we induce polyploid. Don't do it to humans, it doesn't work so good. <laughs> Tissue culture for screening and cloning. Give them cancer, apply treatment, not any cancer treatment, rego plant with specific hormone ratio, and we can then grow many identical. Maybe you've got a favourite tree that you like that is particularly endangered trees, or you've got a tree that you know your grandfather planted in the backyard but it's sadly dying, but you wish to perpetuate its life, you can grab a cell from it and grow many of those. And they're genetically identical, so it is in effect the same tree. Or plant, or radish. Maybe you've got a family radish. <laughs> Genetic manipulation to grant a specific trait. Take the plant, shoot it in the face with a gene gun, wait a week or two, check to see if the plant's fine. You think I'm joking, don't you? Yeah, we shall see. Polyploid, um, get some kind of mutagen. Culture scene is the most common. You can do this and initiate polyploidy in the plant. Um, culture scene is used for a bunch of medicinal purposes. It's in gout medicines and a whole bunch of other things. Don't know why I'm telling you that. Not sure. Can result in plants with multiple copies of DNA, which allows for interbreeding, not interbreeding, interbreeding of plant species. So you cross a two times polyploidy plant with a four times, which means that one's got double the amount of chromosomes, that one's got four times the amount of chromosomes, you mash them together and you get a three times polyploid, which will be sterile, sadly, for the plant that can no longer breed. However, what it produces may be something of a characteristic that we want. For example, seedless watermelons are triplet polyploids. That's how they did it. They mashed did some polyploidy stuff, screwed with their entire genetic code and made this watermelon with that seeds. So, Number one, okay, so you can't kind of grow a watermelon from seed from them because they don't have seeds. But even if they kind of did, they got little seed remnant things, you'd have to grow it from a cutting, which is how they propagate. Again, that's where the tissue culture thing comes into play. Another reason of tissue culture for plants that won't or can't breed, you can just cut a piece off and turn it into more plants. It's a fairly blunt method of plant breeding or hacking by doing this. It's like doing brain surgery with a sledgehammer. It might get rid of the brain, but then may not be so good afterwards. Yeah, next one, tissue culture. Grow plants in little tubes with jelly and hormones and nutrients and stuff. Make them root, shoot and, no, sorry, make them root, you can make them grow shoots and leaves. <laughs> tissue culture is not particularly difficult. Trust me, I've done it for a long time. It's pretty easy kind of stuff, very boring and repetitive. There's a lot of washing up involved. But the big important thing is you've got to keep it sterile because you're working with them growing in little tubs with AVR, which is a really, really good media for growing bacteria and fungus. They really like it. It's nice and clean in China. So you've got to be very careful with this when you're doing it that you make sure you don't introduce any really nasty foreign stuff that you don't want in there. Every four weeks, you've got to pull your little plant out of one tube, bring it in another tube, and continue the process um, because of all the byproducts of the plant actually you know, living, build up in the media, and you kind of have to get rid of that and give them more nutrients to live on as well. Low entry cost of this, the gear to buy the tissue, tissue culture is pretty cheap and readily available, really easy. There's a whole bunch of stuff out in the web for people that do tissue culture. Um, people that grow orchids a lot are really into it, have been for a long time, so there's a heap of sources of information as to how to do this kind of thing. And it's not all that hard to get. Once you've determined your sterile culture technique, you're pretty good. So you need some plants, some plant stuff, um, some plant culture tubes, like 
those kind of things, which is a tube that had some kind of evil coffee beverage in it earlier. Now I feel much better. An autoclave to sterilise many instruments, scalpels and forceps. It's basically like you're going to do surgery, except you're going to cut up little bits of plant. It's going to be done in a sterile environment. Um, an ideal work surface, let's get some pictures. Is this person here with the daggy hand, you don't need to wear that, that's bad. In here is an area where a laminar flow cabinet, which basically filters air out like really, really clean heat filter thing, blows across your work surface so it keeps it free of all nasty bugs. Don't really need that if you've got one, awesome. If you don't, it doesn't matter. Get an old aquarium, turn it upside down, spray it with 70% ethanol, and you're good. That's pretty much it. You don't need a lot of high tech stuff to do this. Um, you can pick these things up. The biggest thing is autoclave. You can buy them pretty cheap. You can also, that's an actual academic <laughs> publication which tells you how to turn a pressure cooker into an autoclave. I probably wouldn't be in the room when you're doing that, to be honest. Because um, 20 psi, 20 minutes, 120 degrees is how you sterilise stuff. Pretty well beyond all existence and recognition. And you have to do that with all your stuff. Your media you produce, your vessels, your instruments, everything. All has to be autoclave to make sure it's all sterile. Because you don't want evil, nasty viruses and bacteria and things growing in there. What do we do then? We hit it with whatever hormone we want it to do. So first off, we give the plant callus. Um, give it cancer by inducing callus. So we take a bit of our plant stuff, a stem or a leaf or whatever, hit it with 2,4-D. Some of you may know what that is. 2,4-dichlorophenoxyacetic acid. Where did those words come from? Um, was used for some fairly nasty purposes in the past, um, but it is still used as a uh, herbicide. That basically it's actually a type of oxen, which makes either roots grow from callus or it can actually make callus grow itself. Effectively, plant cancer. Hit it with a cytokinin that makes shoots grow. Hit it with a gibberellum, that'll make it grow tall. But given that you're playing with a mm, mm, tall, mm, 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 no, don't, don't use gibberellum, it's bad. Uh, the Mendelian genetics, the peas, tall peas, little peas, big peas, that's just gibberellums. One of them had a gene that made gibberellums, one didn't. So short, stunned plants made gibberellums. Ethylene makes your fruit ripen and your leaves fall off. So I wouldn't recommend, no, that's okay, it's plants. You're not plants, we're all good. So banana, put a banana in your other fruit, it's riper quicker. Yeah, that's because it's giving off ethylene gas. Ethylene gas produced by plants is actually a plant hormone, as well as the other things it does. So you can use that to mess with plants as well. Mostly not involved in tissue culture though, unless you're growing bananas in little tubes. Because they'd be really tiny, and by the time you peel the skin off, <laughs> not much left. Use the right combination of these and the right level and the amount of them, and you can pretty well make the plant do whatever you want. You can make it flower. It's like having little miniature bonsais in tubs. You may not be able to do all the things you want to with animals, legally, or other, but with plants, there's no rules, there's no ethics, there's no laws. You can do what you like to. <laughs> They're your judges. First step, give plants cancer. Just like that. Cancer is simply a mass of undifferentiated cells where the DNA process has gone horribly wrong. And 2,4-D oxen does this to plants. So you end up with something that looks like that. Uh, this actually looks like late stage colours where they've hit it with a cytokine to actually make it start producing leaves and things. If you kind of look up in the top right corner there, you can see some little spindly bits coming out. Those are new leaves and shoots falling because it's probably been hit with a cytokine. One of the things on the left here is a, some kind of flowering plant growing in a tube, which has got cute little flowers on it. Uh, right hand side here is a tub with some more, which is actually a larger tub that's mostly used for doing this kind of stuff, where you've got um, a more advanced plant growing. Again, probably can't really kind of see it in the jelly stuff, but that's just stems and leaves. There's no roots, no rooting going on in there at all. Of any description. Diagram here kind of shows the process of taking some stuff and then mashing it and turning it back into plant again. Last one, genetic modification. So I said earlier we can take a protein that produces some kind of sweetness, like that stevia or whatever stuff is that they're putting in Pepsi now. Horrible. Um, and stitch it into another plant. We take one gene, that one little sequence, base pairs are maybe mm, 30 or 40 base pairs, that's all we do. We take that one little sequence and we take that and we stitch it into it. How we do that? We use those evil viruses. They're kind of handy for something. We use a reverse transcriptase to stitch that back into the genetic material of another organism. It's all the same stuff. It doesn't matter. Um, the term transgenics used to get thrown around. But what does it mean? DNA is DNA is DNA. Transorganism means maybe a more appropriate term. And voila, GMO. That's all it is. Take that one bit. There's a lot of hysteria around it. Rightly or wrongly, I don't know. This is an argument that if you take a gene from a peanut plant that produces a protein and you put it in another organism, somehow that other thing is going to turn into a peanut thing and you're going to die from peanut allergy. I don't know. That's not really a legitimate, it's possibly a legitimate concern, there's no evidence. 
the bigger issue is large companies that buy up all the companies that do the genetic modification, they then put in genes and make them resistant to their own herbicides and pesticides, they then sell you the plants, they then sell you the herbicides and pesticides, and you can happily fertilise and pesticide and herbicide the buggery out of them, and the plants will still live. That's where most of the genetic modification stuff with plants is going on. And yes, as you can probably tell by my angry face, I'm not really happy with the way that it works, because it's just kind of lame. So basically, the, there's so much potential to put some really cool genes into plants for medicinal purposes and a whole bunch of other things. So what do we do with them? We just make an environment where we can just dump way more pesticides and herbicides on them. Yay. Awesome. So how do we do that? So we take this gene. So genetic modification itself mostly is really, really boring. You get a little tube with some colourless stuff in it, and another little tube with some other colourless stuff in it, and you mash them together, and you get some other little colours there. And you get another little thing that you can't see, and another thing you can't see, and stick them together, put them in a plate, and grow it, and get something you also can't see. Right. Okay, good. Then you can maybe push it in, and some stripes appear on the gel. Hey, we can see something. That's basically it. That's it. You get stripes on it. So in terms of actually determining whether that's worked or not, mm, mm, we've got some stripes. If you stitch it into an actual organism in the DNA, if you do that for an animal, you kind of have to do it at the single cell stage, really early on. I'm not getting the stem cell stuff either. But that's all other mind drill. But you need to do it at that very early initial level. Because once the DNA is spread throughout the organism, you kind of, at the moment, we can't change that. We can't take us, because every single cell has the exact copy of that DNA in it. And you've got to have some way of changing all of it. And we've got lots of mechanisms and lots of redundancy built into cells in the DNA that says, no, you're not going to do that. If I detect a copy of a gene that's not supposed to be, I'm going to mash it. In that environment where that might be occurring, and we grow them up, and we mess with them, and we hit them with ethanol to see which ones live, take the ones that live, grow them again, mess them with some more ethanol, and so on and so on and so forth. So you're kind of forcing their evolution. That's really easy to achieve. All you need is an egg up late and some alcohol. Easy, good stuff. You can do that. Plain soup. Much easier than trying to mess with the DNA by cutting and pasting genes. Uh,